Oh, sorry. <laughs> I was messing with my timer. Um, anyways, so we have, now that we've kind of established this compromise, oh, let me turn my fan off. Even though we've established this compromise with, um, over the, over the, where the placement of the capital is going to be and over the Bank of the United States, um, the, the frustration, maybe frustration is the wrong word because they, they did compromise, but maybe the concern that men like Hamilton, the, the influence that Hamilton had, the, um, the concern that there are interests that might challenge kind of the, the, uh, the Enlightenment ideals of the Revolution and the, and the Bill of Rights and all that kind of stuff that gets passed, um, that begins to create a, a political party, right? Um, so Jefferson and Madison, who had always been friends, always, 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 and they had a lot in common. Their plantations were fairly close to each other. Um, they're both from Virginia. They're both highly intellectual. Madison was was brilliant. My friend, I, I would argue Madison was more brilliant than Jefferson. Um, but I'm not a Jefferson fan, though. But um, So they're very kind of intellectual. And again, they value the agricultural system. They're concerned about too much emphasis on banking. Um, they are concerned about, I mean, it's not that they necessarily think manufacturing is bad, but they want a much, um, they want a fairer system and, and they don't envision, they don't have Hamilton's vision of what manufacturing can do, right? Um, so they're very much concerned with this little R republicanism. And so they begin to split off from this Federalist Party, really forming their own Democrat Republicans. Now, so you start off with Federalists versus Anti-Federalists, which is really over this issue of do we, to what extent do we amend the Articles of Confederation. Um, now, Anti-Federalists would probably have been attracted to the Democrat Republicans um, because the Democrat Republicans are going to argue for, um, you know, maybe the federal power is going too far. You know, maybe we need to talk about the independence of the states a little bit. So you're going to see the Democrat Republicans kind of embracing some of these anti-federalist ideas. But they're not suggesting that we, that we dismantle the Constitution. What they're suggesting is that there needs to be more of a balance. That if, that if there isn't some kind of counter to Alexander Hamilton and the federalists, that what you're going to end up with is a, a tyrannical federal government. So... And, and this begins over the concern of the Bank of the U.S., how much influence is it going to be. Um, you know, men like Madison and Jefferson, who don't necessarily profit from the bond issue, um, but they know people who have. And they're a little bit worried that, that the, the way the Bank of the U.S. has redeemed the bonds has, has, was unfair. Um, they're concerned about the assumption of debts. You know, is it fair for one state to have to worry about the problems in another state. And this is a problem that we're going to see over and over again when we get to um, issues about the Great Depression. Um, Herbert Hoover, this is one of the reasons why he has a very anemic response, which is because he argues why should people in one state uh, pay taxes to send aid to people in another state. Um, you see that when you're talking about, you know, hurricane relief bills. Um, so we've had a couple of hurricanes and there's like, oh, we need a relief bill. Well, there's an argument to be had that why should people in California care about hurricanes in Texas and Florida? Politically, they're completely different. So why would they care? Um, and so this idea about assumption of debts really goes back to this idea, why should one state care about another state? Um, why should they worry about those people? And this has to do with this idea of national identity and national unity. And of course, the Constitution was meant to create unity, right? We the people. Um, except now here we are right away having this question about, well, what, what does we the people really mean? Um, and there's lots of concerns about, you know, th this balance of power between people that have access to the Bank of the United States, people who have money, and people that are on the cusp of the frontier, that are pushing westward, that are living out the, the little R Republican values, trying to have this aristocracy of merit, trying to work their way up. And if they're having to borrow money, doesn't this disadvantage them? Um, and so this is what's, this is the big concern. And while Madison and Jefferson sign off on the Bank of the United States, um, the next question, though, is, okay, if we can do this with the Bank of the U.S., 
what can we do to other things? Can we amend other things? Um, and so you're going to start to see that Madison and Jefferson, were, especially Madison, will engage in some pretty dirty politics. Um, and there's a whole, like, like if you're interested in journalism, there's a whole series of, like, there's a couple of articles, a couple of newspapers that basically Madison made sure that they ran certain stories attacking Federalist policies. And, and one of the reasons that Adams and Jefferson have a falling out is over sharing bad stories about each other. Um, you know, so we can be critical about current politicians demonizing their, their opponents, but understand that the Founding Fathers did that too. Um, and, you know, the whole thing about Sally Hemings and Jefferson came out because of the Federalists trying to attack and tear down Thomas Jefferson. Um, and so you really have some interesting, I mean, they don't have Twitter, so it's not any kind of Twitter attack. But, um, but definitely they're using, you know, media, they're using pamphlets, they're using newspapers, they're using journalists um, to write salacious and inflammatory things, some of which were true, right, like Sally Hemings, um, and some of which are kind of made up, right? Um, I want to say, and, and don't quote me on this, but I want to say somebody said something about John Adams being like a hermaphrodite or something like that, which was completely false. Um, you know, I might, I'm, I know they said that about one of the, one of the Federalists, but I don't remember for sure which one. I think it was John Adams. So lots of crazy stuff, okay? So don't think that the Founding Fathers were somehow on a pedestal and they all just got along and it was all wonderful and magical because it wasn't. Um, they got pretty nasty with each other. But we still have, and I think I pointed this out when we looked at the problems of the Articles of Confederation, we still have problems with the frontier. We've got foreign policy issues. Um, you can see that the, the rush of people into the Ohio Valley has created some real tensions with the American Indians. Um, and, you know, this is when you see kind of this attempt at pan-Indianism, um, where the Indians, okay, let's put aside our tribal differences and get together and fight these Americans. Um, except, again, it's a little too late. Um, and so you're going to have kind of this issue um, taking place with uh, in the Ohio and Indiana Valleys. Um, and, you know, we have an Indian in Intercourse Act in 1790 that basically dictates that, um, that the federal government treaties with Indian groups directly, that settlers and land speculators can't do that. Um, but despite the laws, and I can't emphasize this enough, that despite the laws and the treaties that the government signs over and over and over again, the... <laughs> Basically, they always side with white American settlers. Always, always, always. Even when they clearly have either violated laws or violated treaties. Um, so the, the frustration with American Indian groups as far as the American government is pretty strong. And, you know, we just in the last year or so had the example uh, with the Dakota Access Pipeline. Um, you know, so these are very real concerns um, that, that have a very long, dirty history to them. Um, you've got Spanish still creating problems with New Orleans, um, even after, you know, even after we've created the Constitution and we've got a president, they're still being difficult. Um, you've got problems with them enticing slaves to run away, that's creating some more tensions. Um, and the U.S. really, really wants to get control of that Mississippi River Valley. Um, the Whiskey Rebellion, I mentioned the tax on whiskey and how the farmers in, in the western states would prefer to make, turn it into whiskey so that it was easier to transport. Um, and this excise tax is going to create a lot of frustration. These farmers are actually going to kind of create a rebellion. Or, uh, rebellion, I use that term loosely. They're going to uh, have an uprising, I guess is probably a little bit better. Um, and they're going to try to march uh, on, I think, Philadelphia um, to try to make some noise about, hey, you know, this is taxation without representation. You're taxing us to benefit another group, and this is wrong. Um, and basically, George Washington uh, gets some military guys together and goes and slaps them down and says, no, then we're not going to behave like this. We're, we're going to, you know, I, I know you don't like this, but this is the way it's going to be. It's time to grow up and take your medicine, you know. Um, and so Washington really kind of puts down that Whiskey Rebellion and, um, you know, and it really kind of depicts this kind of core frustration, which is that there's always going to be a group of people that's unhappy with the policies of government. Um, and, you know, if you let the concerns of a small group of people, in this case, the Pennsylvania farmers, dictate the way the rest of the country functions, 
we're not going to get anything done ever, ever, ever. So it, it is a little bit unfair to the Pennsylvania farmers. Um, but it, it just, you know, when you're trying to govern as a country, sometimes hard decisions have to be made. Um, and so this military response is going to really set the standard that, okay, we're past all this mob action, all this Sons of Liberty, Boston Tea Party, you know, throwing stones at soldiers. We're past that. We're not doing this anymore. And I think it's very ironic that by the time you get to the 1790s, the U.S. government's basically behaving the way the British government behaved, which is you're not allowed to get your guns and go marching down the street creating problems. And guess what? You have to pay a tax. And guess what? You have to follow these rules. So you have the U.S. government really having to behave a lot like, you know, a government. Um, and that's kind of interesting, right? Um, because governments are required. They sometimes have to do things that are unpopular or that we don't like. Um, the question that, that we as citizens should always ask, and in the case of the Whiskey Rebellion, these Pennsylvania farmers, for all that they were frustrated personally, the excise tax enabled the U.S. government to pay off the debts from the Revolutionary War, get the country on a sound economic footing, um, put to rest this bond issue that had been dictating all this conversation for so long. That's gone away. They can get back to other things like creating infrastructure, like resolving the Mississippi River Valley problem, getting access to New Orleans, helping, you know, helping the states along the border with Florida. Um, so they can start focusing on those things. And, you know, and, and it isn't fair to the Pennsylvania farmers, but it's what's best for the country as a whole. And so this is what you see happening um, during this time period. And it's, and it's frustrating for some people, and, and that's very unfortunate. Now, we will be doing a reading on one of the Indian groups, um, but I just want to kind of touch very briefly. I, I don't focus over much on Indian groups because there's just not time. Um, and, but, I mean, understand that there's a whole, like, there's a whole sub-area, sub-genre of history that's focused on Native Americans. Um, but I do want to touch on a few concepts because these are concepts that we'll see over and over again. Um, the Indians that, that have now been left in this area past the Appalachians, in the Ohio Valley, in the Mississippi Valley, um, now that there's not this international tension with Britain uh, or, and maybe France and, and, the, and the American colonies, now that it's just the United States, um, they're, they're pretty vulnerable. And the United States is, is basically predicated on this idea that Americans can keep moving west. Americans can keep going where they want to go. And as I mentioned before, they, the American settlers don't typically pay attention to treaties and laws about who can treaty with them and all that kind of stuff. And the government always takes their side. So basically, these American Indians are left with some very difficult choices. Um, some, of course, um, are going to be faced with this. Well, some white settlers are going to look at the American Indians and they're going to suggest that well, the answer to resolving the tensions with American Indians is to make them just like us, right? Make them good little Christians, make them good little Americans, make them, you know, either good little farmers or, you know, educate them. Um, and so there's kind of this paternalism, um, which is a term you should remember from us talking about Solomon Northup. Kind of this paternalism that we're going to bring kind of this civilization, this education um, to these American Indian groups, right? Right. And we'll assimilate them and absorb them into our culture, and eventually we'll all kind of become the same thing. Now, I point out here that American Indians have a different skin tone, um, and they dress differently, and they have cultural differences, right, that create, you know, challenges. I mean, remember we read about the French and the Spanish and how they dealt with those, those cultural differences, um, and how the English dealt with the cultural differences. So, you know, is it possible to fully assimilate? Um, I think so eventually, um, but it takes multiple generations. And in, in the meantime, as you have, you know, subsequent generations trying to assimilate, what is their life like? Given what we know about Americans and their background with American Indians, what is the likelihood? What is the reasonable likelihood? I mean, assuming you don't know, you haven't heard anything about, you know, the battle over the Great Plains or anything like that. So you don't know what's going to happen. But just looking back from, you know, say 1795 backwards, would you predict that assimilation was truly, truly possible for American Indians? 
And I would suggest that no, that, that it was going to be a very long, difficult process for those that wanted to try assimilation. Um, and I think that, that, of course, now that we take the blinders off, um, our, our metaphorical blinders, and we're looking at the rest of history after 1795, you can definitely see that that was the case. So, again, the U.S. government doesn't care about fair treatment. Western expansion is the most important thing. You have a couple of, you have four different responses, and these four responses will hold true regardless of, regardless of what you're talking about, um, whether you're talking about these Eastern tribe Indians or whether you're talking about Western tribe Indians. Um, you have coexistence, assimilation, resistance, and annihilation. Um, if you're coexisting, you are typically maintaining kind of a sense of unity. You typically have an area that you can kind of live in as a tribe. You still have your culture. You still have your religion. Um, typically, you're economically disadvantaged and struggling. The Iroquois certainly embody this. And we, if you study the Iroquois specifically, you can see how this once, you know, major player in colonial politics, by the time you get to the 1800s, is just struggling to survive, right? Struggling to hold their own, um, being taken advantage of, really kind of frustrated with this whole process. Um, you're going to have the Cherokee, which we'll be talking about when we get to Andrew Jackson. They actually approach assimilation. They begin to educate. They begin to develop a language. They, they Christianize many of them. Um, they have slaves. They have plantations. They do all this kind of stuff, which is exactly what the Americans say they want them to do. And then, of course, we'll see in the 1830s, Andrew Jackson will forcibly remove them. So assimilation doesn't work out su super well for them either. Um, and, you know, the individual Indians that try to move off and assimilate, they're going to struggle as well, um, at, least until, at least until they are able to completely pass for just being a white American. Um, Shawnee, um, they are in that kind of south southeast area. Um, they will try resistance. They will be attacking and fighting back. Um, but the U.S. just keeps sending soldiers, and you keep having militias going after them. Um, and then the Creek Indians will face annihilation. Um, they'll get kind of tangled up with the Shawnee conflict, and basically they'll start to try to wipe them out. And all of this is about claiming their land and getting their land. Um, next, we have ideas of international tension. So we have the U.S. acting like a government. Um, we've got some tensions with American Indians. Um, now we're going to see that you have international problems with this French Revolution thing, right? So the French Revolution is going to trigger a European war. Um, and George Washington wants us to be neutral. He doesn't want us to take sides. He knows we're a brand new country. We can't really afford to get involved into a European conflict. Plus, isn't that why we wanted to be separate in the first place? Um, plus, you've got some very real issues, right? Um, first off, you've got, we don't have enough money for a Navy. Um, we're having problems to build a Navy, and until we have a Navy, it's not going to do us any good anyways, right? Because remember, the Navy is... You know, you can have soldiers at home and you can have militia groups, but how are you going to get them places, right? So you, you, can't, you can't wait for the British to send troops to you. You want to be able to have a Navy to stop those, sh those ships before they actually get to your land. Um, you have some Barbary pirates, which we'll talk about more with Thomas Jefferson. Barbary pirates are in the Mediterranean and in Africa, um, North Africa particularly. So they're hanging out there around the Mediterranean, around kind of the Spain, the Straits of Gibraltar area, and they are creating havoc. Um, there's some interesting analysis, and I'll try to share this video with you as well, that has to do with um, the Barbary pirates and kind of the fact that this is an early, um, kind of an early level of the American conflict with um, Muslim nations um, because the Barbary pirates really see the Americans as infidels. They see them as fair game to attack. Um, and they do this with lots of other European countries, but they also tend to respect force. So they tend to not, you know, and part of why they're attacking the U.S. is because the U.S. doesn't have a strong navy. Um, and other countries that don't have strong navies basically pay extortion money so that they don't get bothered by the Barbary pirates. And so you're going to have some real interesting developments with that. So understand you've got problems with them. Um, and, you know, basically the U.S. likes the fact that Britain's more concerned with France. They're more concerned with this 
kind of, you know, anti-monarchical kind of uprising that you see happening first in the U.S., then in France, um, and kind of other kind of elements of that um, popping up in other places. Um, and so this is going to be, so you're going to have people that are like, well, at least the Britain's not trying to come and reconquer us. Why should we get involved? Because that would just invite Britain to care. You know, they would just remind him that, remind them that we're here. Um, but you also have people that are very much supportive of the French Revolution. Jefferson is one of those, um, that really sees, um, really sees the, the French Revolution as, as a, another variation of the American Revolution, so we should support it, plus we've got this Treaty of Friendship. But then you've also got people like Alexander Hamilton that really admire the British, admire the British Empire, the British economic system, and really while they were happy to receive help from France, they don't trust France. And, and remember back to the Treaty of Paris, most Americans were a little bit, you know, they thought the French and the Spanish were kind of shady. Um, and we don't trust that they're not going to try to take us over, too. Um, so you've got this kind of simmering pot of problems. Um, you've got American ships that are being seized by Great Britain. Uh, they're forcing American soldiers to serve in the British Navy, which the British Navy is not a, not a fun job, right, during this time frame. They typically used criminals and that kind of thing, um, you know, Nonviolent criminals, I guess. Um, and so this frustration with impressing American soldiers is making people mad and it's interfering with trade. Um, and we've got this problem with Spain over New Orleans. Um, and so we're trying to resolve these foreign policy issues that have to do with the French Revolution and Great Britain trying to force our soldiers into service, and then with Mississippi Valley and New Orleans. So you're going to have two treaties, Jay's Treaty and Pinckney's Treaty. Um, Jay's Treaty is typically seen as the less popular of one because it basically gives uh, the, the British kind of a, a chance to come in and collect debts. Um, and it's very much tied to banking interests and that kind of thing and with manufacturing interests. Whereas Pinckney's Treaty is going to be highly popular because it will basically solidify our ability to trade through New Orleans um, and give us a little bit more territory in, in Flor or trade in trade into New Orleans and give us more territory in Florida. Um, and so they, they pair these two treaties together in Congress so that they both pass. Uh, which is kind of interesting. So Pinckney's Treaty is very popular, Jay's Treaty is not. Um, but there again, you see the role of kind of this division with the Democrat Republicans and the Federalists, which is that one of these plans is highly supported by the Federalists, Jay's Treaty, and one of these plans is highly supported by the Democrat Republicans, which is Pinckney's Treaty, because Pinckney's Treaty opens up more land for farmers, helps farmers trade, Jay's Treaty helps the bankers and helps the manufacturers. So you've got kind of this idea that we're already having these tensions coming up. Um, and so these, this foreign policy different, that difference that we see coming out with Jay and Pinckney is going to dominate the, the political parties and really drive the political parties farther and farther apart. Um, so our political party, this emergence that really begins initially over the Bank of the U.S., that begins over, you know, should we be worried about this necessary and proper flexible constitution stuff? Like what's going to happen with that? And then it's solidified by these questions about these international tensions. You're going to see that the political parties both have competing visions um, for what the country should look like. Um, and they have competing visions about what our international relationships should look like. Should we be friends with Britain or should we be friends with France? Um, and in the meantime, you have Washington as president trying to navigate this, claiming all along neutrality, neutrality, neutrality. Um, but the political parties are going to... The, the, even though Washington tries to be above the fray, so to speak, the political parties are really going to go at it. Uh, Jefferson will resign as Secretary of State because he feels that Hamilton has too much influence. Madison's relationship with Washington will fracture because of Hamilton. Um, Adams will have his own level of frustration with Hamilton because Hamilton kind of has... Washington's ear, and Hamilton doesn't want to be vice president. He likes being in the cabinet. He likes kind of being the, the helper for Washington. Um, and so you've got a real interesting kind of uh, dynamic happening here. Um, 
you know, with these different political parties, and it's all tied to this competing vision. And again, they use some pretty dirty tactics. And so I think it's important for you to realize that in many ways, our political party system is, is just as awful today as it was back then. Um, you know, and, and back then they had Washington, right? Um, and Hamilton and Jefferson and Madison. And so, you know, understand that political parties are a part of the process. Um, and the question is, what do we do with those political parties? So I'm going to stop here and then we'll recap kind of the differences. Um